and welcome to the new location. Who likes it? Hands up that likes this location. Yeah? Well, we wanted to experiment with it somewhere new, you know. JPL was getting a bit boring, but this is nice. I feel it's bigger but more intimate, you know. And when we're moving to intimate, we have more up, close and personal conversations, you know. So, small venue, big ideas. So that's the whole reason why we chose this place. So I'm glad you like it. Um, so, thank you for coming, everyone. Actually, I'm really interested. Who Who's here for the first time this evening? Nice! Nice! Well, you know we have over four and a half thousand members now. Can you believe it? Is that right? Yeah, four and a half thousand! Four and a half thousand. What an amazing community. And you know, it got started by two wonderful people here, Nadu and Jonathan, over ten years ago. And the great thing about this wonderful community is that we're not the ordinary. We're not the ordinary designers, are we? No, come on, you're not ordinary. That's why we're all here. And the reason why we have this amazing community is because we go beyond the ordinary. I think we're all striving to get out of our comfort zones and to just do that extra bit every day and like over <laughs> overcome the <laughs> and just take that one leap of faith into where no one else is going with design and that's why we're here and that's why this community exists so thank you all for coming this evening um i want to also thank aspects so where's peter and jack give a round of applause for them again So thank you very much. I know you're hiding. Oh, there you are in the <laughs> corner. <laughs> I'll get you on stage one day, Jack. One day. I will. I promise you. Um, so just a couple of um, other things. We're going to be recording this session. And please have all mobile phones off as well. Please, thank you. We're going to be recording this session today. So um, it will be on YouTube um, early next week. But we are also on the other socials as well, so on uh, LinkedIn and Instagram. So please feel free after this evening to continue the conversation. Um, I think it's really important. And by the way, it's without without you guys, we don't keep this going. You know, and it's really important for us to understand what it is that makes your buttons tick. What is it that you? want to explore with your practice, with your craft. So please, during this evening after this talk, come and talk to you know, to Jonathan, to I, to Nada, to Leopold, to Jack and Peter. What is it that you want to learn about? What is it that you want to discover? Because you're not just here just to network with amazing people. I think you're also here to learn, again, to get out of that comfort zone a little bit every single day. So please give us this feedback because you know we, we want to curate the content for next year so send us a message send messages on linkedin just give us the more feedback we we get the better okay so we're going to have a very interesting evening and maybe we should get you already sat down so i can do the intros jonathan crash leopold where are you <laughs> Crash, take a seat, yeah. So, we've been talking to some people earlier. I think the, the word persuasion has, you know, um, grabbed people's attention. And it's a really interesting topic, isn't it? Um, persuasion. And so, we're going to have a really interesting fireside chat about this. Now, I'm not going to reveal too much, but I do want to introduce the speakers that we have today. I'm going to start with Crash. Yes, you heard me. Crash. Um, I, I always wonder what your parents were thinking, um, to be honest with you. But I think I think they wanted to toughen you up a bit, didn't they? They wanted to give you a good head, you know, start in life. And I think Crash has really taken his name to the extreme in what he does today. 
He is a founder and a CEO of a company called Startable. And um, he's about company formation, personal branding, and probably taking people out of really bad potential crashes and converting them into opportunities. I think that's probably your superpower. <laughs> potential crashes. Potential crashes, exactly. No, but he also has a really great experience. So um, Crash was also um, in his previous life um, an art director of client experience at Publicis Sapien. And before that, um, he was an experiential designer in Adobe. So he has uh, an immense worth of experience combining creativity, resilience, um, and everything rolled into one. So really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Crash. And then we have Leopold Ajami. Now his name, <clears throat> his name, he's the type of name that you read in the history books, right? You probably also own a kingdom or something of sorts, right? <laughs> but he also told me this morning that his, the name Leopold means bold as a lion. And now I know why you've got long hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was always such a mystery to me, but now I get it. You know, I mean, you don't want to, if you, if you find, a, if you bump into Leopold in the wilderness, you know, you think twice before challenging him because, you know, Leopold by name, Leopold by nature, um, and, his, and his hair, it's, it's, it's all about the branding, amazing. But Leopold is a very interesting character because he, in fact, is one of the very, very, very few people in the world that are certified ethical, ethically persuasive trainers, certified by the godfather of persuasion, Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's also a founder of the Cialdini Institute, and he's also another founder of the Novel Philosophy Academy, where he helps many people especially from big players such as Google, Meta, and large consulting firms. And he helps people to find their voice and, um, and present themselves in a very persuasive way. And on top of that, he's just published an amazing book, How to Hear Yes More Often. And I think we all need to hear that more in our lives every day, not just in our work, but in, in just day-to-day -day life. So, if you're lucky, tonight you'll get a signed copy of his book by the lion himself. So stay on for tonight, stay on for tonight, and um, you'll be lucky to have one. Last but not least, Jonathan. No dramatic name there, I'm afraid. It's just Jonathan. Dependable though, dependable practical. And you know, it's really important that we've got Jonathan here tonight because he's going to be able to, look, when you've got someone like Crash and you've got someone like uh, Leopold that looks like a lion and sounds like a philosopher, you need someone to keep the powder in order, you know, and to keep everyone focused. So without ado, please a round of applause for these three amazing people. the moderator who's going to keep us all on track. Okay? Looking forward to this. Thank you, Natalie. Round of applause for Natalie. Don't run away from the microphone. We need to crash down. Oh, Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, this was an experiment, and so far, you've proven that uh, people do come to Sports City. Um, and tonight's going to be very different, very different from uh, every other meetup we've done. It could go horribly bad, like when like the mic that. stops working. <laughs> um, but it also potentially will be very interesting. I just want to tell you a little bit about how tonight came about. Um, Leopold wrote this amazing book. Uh, he's been very busy. Natalie's been busy. Nada and myself also have been busy. And I thought that it would be great to bring two people who are not your usual kind of designer, 
Personally, I believe that everyone's a designer. To, de to design is to be human. But they themselves were quite confused when I approached them. And uh, as Leopold's been, for a very you know, confident, one of the best public speakers I know, he's been a little bit nervous. Um, and he's been asking me, what are you going to talk about? You know, Crash, what are we talking about? Um, and Crash also had a similar kind of a, of a view. And what I said to them was, I want to bring outside thinking to solve this challenge. And, and I want all of you to be involved, so be ready. I'm going to come to any of you. If you sit in the back and you hide, I'm definitely coming to you first. Um, some of you have already spoken about, and I, and I want us to, to just talk about this challenge a little bit. Personally, I've been doing this in different ways in, uh, for a little over 20 years, and it's not always been called the same thing. Um, but everywhere I've been, Australia or here, or working with a remote startup or anywhere, I've always had the same challenge. And it's not only as a corporate, it's also as an individual. And that challenge is how do we translate the value of what we do? How do we translate what we're trying to do? Sometimes we don't quite know. It could be, I want to do more research. I want to do more strategy. I actually think we should be building something else, not what you're telling me. Has anyone else had this challenge? If you don't put your hand up, I will come to you. Yeah. So I brought in two people from outside of our typical world, and it's not only in a corporate, like I said, it could be you as an individual. Many of us are struggling, right? I was there too, Dubai is a tough place, and we're starting our own businesses. How do we translate the value of what we do, what we bring as a business? So we're not gonna just dive straight into the, the solution as we do, we're gonna sit on the problem. So I'm coming to you, be ready. Um, and I wanna talk about this problem a little bit. I'm going to start with Brenton. <laughs> you tell me. Have you had this challenge recently in your career, articulating the value of what you do? Articulating the value of what I do personally or to the project? I think what I've had a problem with more so is I'm the kind of person who will speak out a lot of detail very quickly. And I've only recently started to learn actually how to slow myself down, actually how to talk in a way that's not to someone who I think is, I don't know, who wants all the detail at the same time, so it's about pacing myself. And I think the rule I've had in my life, or in the last couple of months, is how do I talk to myself, uh, talk about what I do to someone who doesn't actually know the terms or the jargon of what I do in particular. So that's what I've been working on, that's what has been most challenging, to, especially for clients at the moment. Great. Christina, what about you? My challenge in the career? Yeah. As a designer, do you find the challenge? Yeah, so especially when people uh, start questioning my decisions, my design decisions, uh, this is like the how you convince them and then uh, make them in the picture to understand why we have this design in that way because uh, we design you know, on purpose everything uh, and uh, sometimes it's hard to just all the time justify your uh, your designs yeah yeah so this is the big challenge anyone else we need more alcohol come on yes I believe the most of the challenge is to calculate ROI. ROI, return on investment. For me, it was the biggest challenge to convince business to invest money in this design or feature. This is the worst part for me. But uh, somehow I start to learn it, but try to find a solution more and more for that. Anyone else before we come? Chris wants to say something. Chris, yes. Thank you, Gareth. Gareth told me to say it's all about empathy. You know about that here? And without trying to jump to the solution, yes, going back to my consultant days and doing freelance days, it's often the client or the customer comes to you and says, We need this thing. It has to be this thing. We've seen this thing. We want this thing. Let's build this thing. And you're like, Okay. And it's 
often a whole room of people jumping on onto this ship and starting to sail towards the what they think is going to be the sun the sunrise and then no one's asked why so yeah happens a lot Riley? I was just trying to be helpful. Um, so I think I probably come from a bit of a different experience. So I've been working as an account director for the last four and a half years. So my job was always to create value for the client. Um, and I think, yeah, any salesperson will know that value is perceived. So how does someone actually perceive value out of what you're doing? Um, I've recently left corporate and am now growing my own, so it's going to be a journey of figuring out how do I now position myself as valuable to someone else. Um, but I think being able to understand what is important to someone and what looks like success to them, if you can hit those triggers and balance being able to be authoritative and bringing your perspective and your expertise with understanding their true challenges, that's kind of where you start to hit the sweet spot. But yeah, that's an art that I have to figure out. Nice. What about at a larger scale? Peter? Like if we look at many designers <laughs> and try to explain to the client, I know you're asking for this, but this is kind of where you should be going. Oh, thanks for picking on me. Um, yeah, so like I work at a quite a large consultancy. Um, again, also in the corporate world, financial services. Um, I think for us, it's not just about what the designers do, but it's their, probably their contribution to more than just the experience. It's more a proposition design. What are they actually offering their customers? How do you get a business function or CIO or CTO to actually challenge what they're offering is to the customer, not just the experience they're trying to create? And I think that's a real, real value. So when you're talking about big scale work, I think that's that's where we play, and it's a huge challenge, right? Not just the design experience, but the design proposition. Yeah, wants to say something. Should we? Yeah. I'll answer this in two ways. The first one, I think you need to, as a designer, you need to know what is commercial value to a business. So you need to. Um, you know, not just be able to do stuff that looks cool or whatever, you need to make sure you deliver stuff that's all, that has financial and commercial value to business. And number two, I would say that um, if you are struggling to show value to the client through yourself, um, why is that happening? Like if you are a very strong designer, that value should be evident. And if it isn't, there's an issue there, right? So, um, yeah, that's something that needs to be thought about. Um, typically, the survival is very visual, so everyone's like, mm, that's cool. But adding that business and commercial value to it is like the digging in the end, you know? Turn it up a bit. Okay. I'm going to go to our audience, now, our panel. Please. What are your thoughts from your clients and from the work that you do? Are you, is, is this a typical challenge that you see? Leopold, you want to start? And, and, and any responses you have to some of what you heard? I mean, there are different areas, I think. Uh, so, Brandon, I think he talked about sharing your value too quickly, right? Okay, so I want to share a quick tip uh, just on that point. And I'm going to pick on Jonathan. Thank you. Since you were picking on that. It's <laughs> great. Uh, okay, there, there is a principle that I call <coughs> sorry, the candy principle. And uh, if you think about it, there's two ways you can give a child the candy. The first way is you just tell the child, here's the candy. You want one? Here's the candy. And the child will take it and say, thank you. The other way is to say, close your eyes, I have something for you, no peeking, no peeking, and then Here's something special for you, all right? Now, the same principle happened with communication and sharing our value. And Jonathan, even though I keep telling him, don't do this, just did it. So notice what Jonathan did. He told you, well, I believe that to be a designer is to be human. And he just said it, just by like giving candy in the same way. All right, I told you I'm going to become you. So, but how could he have done it is create anticipation. He could have said, but here's something that I learned that took me so much time to learn. 
we're all designers. To be a designer is to be human. That's a completely different experience, right? So one of the things in how we share our value is really to design the exact statement we want to say and deliver it in a way that will make people think and say, oh, I never thought about that, you know? So the, the lesson is never step on the value. When you say it quickly and without intention and anticipation, you're literally stepping on it. So that's a good one. Nice. Rash, what about yourself? Yeah, that's a really good way to put it, right? We, we spoke about that very briefly. So me and Leopold actually don't know each other very well. I've only had one conversation over coffee, so it's going to be very interesting to go back and forth um, tonight. Or maybe we'll just agree, who knows? Um, but that's a very, very good point, right? I'll just agree. You'll just agree. <laughs> I don't believe it. It's a very, very good point, right? It's of his specific thing, not necessarily what everybody asked when we yeah. went through the question towards. And my question to you was, okay, what's the difference between those two things? One is you're just giving the information, and the second thing is you're creating a moment. Oh, that specific example, right? So you're building anticipation, you're getting people to lean in, and then you're building tension, as they call it in filmmaking, and then you're releasing tension. So there's a difference between just telling somebody something random or you're creating a moment. I don't know if that's related to uh, specifically the questions we said then, but that's something we spoke about to begin with, and I agree with you 100%. And the example that I had was now that I, I was completely agnostic of social media for the first 12 years of my career. One, because it didn't really exist before, but I was just against it. And it's making me much better as a storyteller because I'm learning about how to grab somebody's attention, deliver value in like 30 seconds. And you all know this because it's called the hook. Right? And that's, I think that's a very similar thing. You're creating a moment, you're grabbing people's interest, and then you're building tension, and then you're releasing tension with them. Yeah, I mean, there are so many questions asked here, but uh, I think the essence is really how do you introduce... So, so one, of the, one of the problem I always notice is how do you introduce yourself? Right? When you have to. So I've been speaking to many of you, and you know the answer is always, I'm a UX designer. I'm a product designer. I'm a, you know. And I remember once we were in a meetup, uh, HCD meetup, and someone asked me, so I was listening, product designer, uh, you know, service designer, UX designer, and someone asked me, what do you do? Uh, I'm a voice designer. And by simply saying that, they were like, oh, you know, what is that? So I think one of the things we should all learn to do is how to introduce ourselves in a way that is so interesting and it's not about what we do, it's about what, uh, what you said about the value. I help X people achieve this so that they can reach that kind of result, you know? This is a great technique, especially in networking and, you know, meet up, to try it out. Try to say, I work with this. Okay, here's an example from what I say usually. I say, I help leaders design a voice that amplifies their voice. And now there's a conversation. People, how do you design a voice? And how does that affect their worth? You know, so and now I have something to talk about. But the introduction, and this is a key principle of persuasion as well. The way you introduce yourself when you have to is essential to how people perceive you. So I jumped on the question. Crash, you look like you're Yeah. Um, I forget who it was down there, but they said very correctly that value is perceived. Right? In a business sense, you can disagree with that because you can say, I'm proving that you provide an outcome that's going to make the business money. But it's very much on what Leopold is saying, now the value is perceived and you're creating better, a better way to create value or a better way to sell the value that you have by wording it and, and showing it in a different way. Rather than, it's almost very similar to the same thing when you build the build intention, you're releasing it. By changing the way that you describe what you do, it sounds much more valuable, even though it's, I don't want to say it's the same thing, but the words you've chosen to do and who you've chosen to deliver it to has completely changed the way that it's being perceived. So you can have the exact same, I don't want to say the exact same things, they're all different ways, you know, but you can take the same thing you're trying to sell, show, deal with, get rid of, move, you know, uh, create whatever it is that you do, and then you can, the way that you deliver that and the words you choose to deliver that 
will greatly affect the way that people perceive what it is, even though it's the same thing. And it's not lying, because you're still talking accurately about the same object. I, I just want to say something here, because usually the word perceive goes down to the road of... That's why I said, like, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I think, I think uh, the way... Let me put it this way. Yes, the value is perceived, but it has to be real. Yeah. Right? The perception is sometimes how you place the value, where you place the words. How, like for example, what Natalie did today is amazing. Okay, and we didn't know if she's gonna do that, but she introduced us in a very interesting way. Right? She didn't read our CD or buy it. She did an introduction, and by simply introducing us, she raised our authority in your eyes. So that makes a big difference. Now, she's not faking what she said, it's true, but it perceptually is very important for our mind. It's a shortcut to our mind to say, oh, crash seems like an authority. Yeah, and I agree with that 100%, right? I often see people who are caught up on the, well, I'm not a salesman, I don't want to bullshit. Being a better communicator does not make you a bullshit up, because you're still talking about the same thing. One example I gave, uh, in a recent presentation I gave was, okay, imagine you went out during the night and you had a very boisterous night, right? And then the next day you saw your mom, you saw your best friend, and you saw your partner. You're gonna tell that same story and it's gonna be accurate. The way you tell it is gonna be very different to your perceived audience. Not perceived audience, your actual audience. And that's not lying, that just means you're a communicator. You're communicating effectively by targeting your message to the audience in front of you. And I'm sure you all do that naturally. So I don't think you should get caught up on, oh, I'm lying, or it's manipulation, or I'm bullshit. You're just being a more effective communicator about something that actually exists. Can we get into like a practical example? I mean, for myself, and I'm sure some of, and also for some of you that I spoke to, one of our challenges is that design is becoming commoditized. Designers are turning into developers, many designers. Um, regardless of their skill set, they're just being told what to do. Or they're told, I just want you to move these pixels over here. This tool dominates the market. I just, you're the whiz in this tool, just do that. But often, they want to do more. But they don't know how to articulate that. What is your advice to them, Leopold? I want to do research. I want to do service design. I want to be strategic. I want to do product marketing and get out of just pure design. It's not just about me introducing myself. It's how do I reshape my role and the value of what I can bring? I, I, don't, I don't understand the question. Is it how do I... Wow, well, we got Leopold. This is the first time. <laughs> I'm saying, if, if, if I'm inside of an organization, and I'm just told, and design is becoming much more focused on just the pixel moving, just the visual aspect of design, but I'm also a strategist, a UXer, I want to do experimentation. How do I sell that to my company or to our organization? Or I'm an individual, and I've just gone out on my own, and I want to say that part of the experience, I know you just seen a beautiful flashy design that someone's done, but to get to that flashy design and to align with your client needs, I need to do these other steps. Mm. Uh, okay, since we're talking about persuasion, let me let me bring that in and you know tie it up. So raise your hand if you if persuasion is important to you. Okay. Almost all of you. Can someone just tell me why? Why is it important to you? We use it in our everyday life. Talking with, with our kids, talking with our colleagues, talking with potential customers. Yeah. So it's everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Why do you think it's Yes. Do it. uh, we cannot do everything by ourselves. We are dependent, right? So we need others to move, take action. Any persuasion for Okay. I love that. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I think it's like just a desire to be understood. Uh, Ooh, I love that. What, what did he say to that? The desire here? to be understood. Yeah, I love that. We haven't heard from Nada. <laughs> I guess just to add to what Ron said, um, it's to, to reach a goal. I'm trying, I'm trying to persuade 
let's say, management, my CEOs, my teams, it's because I have a goal in mind and I need to reach it, so I need to make sure that I'm, I'm selling it to those people who are also part of getting that goal together. Yeah, totally. Anyone else? Yeah? To save time. I love that. I, I love just that. gave you the information, no anticipation, nothing. Yeah, to save time. I love that. Okay, now raise your hand if you studied the science of persuasion. We have one. Right? Two, yeah. How, how deep, please? Yeah. yeah, a little bit, okay. Well, there's a hundred years of research behind this language. And I think that's one of the main problems designers have. Because, and at least in my perspective, when we think about, when I talk to designers, they say, oh, I'm a design, I'm a product designer, I'm a service, I des what do you design? I design solutions, I design experiences. But you know what I learned? You are designers of decisions. That's what you do every single day, you design decisions for yourself, for your users, for your stakeholders. And so one of the most important skills for you is to learn how to persuade people because that's how you help people make better decisions, you see? So for me, before you even think about where do I want to be next, uh, should I stay in that company or not, it should be, do I know how to design a decision for me, for the recruiter that is hiring me, for the company, you know? So that's all under values. How do I become a better designer of decisions? I think that's the key question. Crash. Your original question was very specific and I'm gonna say very difficult because the answer might be there is no solution to you. And I'll come back to this, but if you're in a tight company that has a factory set up, that A goes to B, goes to C, goes to C, goes to D, and that's the way the workflow works as a business and you're trying to break out of that, there might not be a solution for you to get out of it. The solution might be that you have to leave the company. To be honest. But the Riley, I want to get your name correctly. Yeah. She nailed it in the beginning when she said that she was corporate side and now she's moved across where she's working with designers and she can see that the designers really struggle to speak the corporate language. When what corporate wants to know is is this gonna work, how much money is it gonna make me, how is it gonna benefit the business, right? And the best way the best way to start learning about persuasion is how do you effectively communicate to the person you talk to? And the best way to effectively communicate the person you talk to is to speak their language. And their language will be, what do they benefit if it happens this way? So this is something I struggled with dramatically at the beginning of my career because I wanted to be across all things. But when you have no experience when you're 25, you put in a room and you have a certain uh, a specific role, right? Okay, cool. And, so, keep going. And if you're able to figure out You'll, you'll probably be within the structure, right? So you're often designing things on behalf of other people that they're gonna then use to their higher ups. This is a very specific in corporate question. If you can figure out for that individual what it is they are trying to get from that presentation, let's say, and you tweak that presentation that delivers them what they need from it, you can then much more likely be able to convince them to adopt that design because it gives them what they need when they go higher up the chain. Nice. I want to go to the audience with this one. Um, Peter, I'm coming to you. Because Peter has helped me to build design teams and he's placed some great designers. And he has a very difficult job because he's got to tell these designers and persuade them that this is an amazing role. And then sometimes, we're not going to name names, they get there and maybe things change or maybe things aren't as amazing. And then they come and they say, Peter, what do I do? I want to. You signed me up and I wanted to research you, but normally I think I look. Yeah, it's difficult for me because obviously I'm not a designer, but what I would say in sort of backing up all the designers in the room, like, <laughs> unfortunately, this market and some of these companies, I, sometimes I, I don't really think they really, really understand the true power of what you guys do. So when I listen to all these things that you're saying, I think you've got to learn to just simplify what you do in the best possible way and then really showcase the impact and the value that it's going to have on the business. And so unfortunately, nine times out of ten, it is, it does come down to money or revenue or profits and things like that. So 
Yeah. Peter, what about you? You have hundreds of designers. What, what do you say to them? I mean, some of them are in the room. Like when they when they say to you, like, I want to do more. I can do more, but I'm stuck in this lane. Yeah, two of them are sitting at this table. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just had the, same, had the same conversation today, actually. Um, we were talking about the factory model, like you mentioned it, right? From A to B to C to D. I think you've got to be a little bit more proactive. You've got to put some extra hours in because that factory model is not going to change anytime soon. You don't want to see people leave the company just because there's a process in place, but I would rather see them challenge me or challenge clients of that model, right? And actually, when I was talking earlier about the, the, the proposition, what they're actually benefiting the customer, you go challenge the product guys who are telling you what to do. My, my mate Taj here, he's, he's we're just talking about the same thing. Like taking orders from product managers and not being part of actually the thinking process. To put it bluntly, like, you have to grow a set of balls, right? You have to go challenge these people. And there's lots of capability, lots of creativity. I just don't think people are pushing themselves in the right, in the right environments. Right, you have to go up the, up the chain and learn how to communicate as, as the guy said, but I think that's the key thing is you've got to get out of that comfort zone very quickly or you're just going to keep doing the same shit. I'd say that to about 100 people. <laughs> nice. Anyone else? Has this chat? Yes, yeah, sir. You got a couple of people. Yeah, you were holding your hand up early. I'm a product manager, so I'll talk from that perspective. And I work with designers all the time. And then to say, like, how do you uh, share what value you are creating for the business? So there's a thing called to be or to do. Sometimes you think that you are creating a value, but is this a real value? So how you can do that? So there's one practical thing that I've noticed that if you detach yourself from what you're doing or your design and go out there and see like where your work fits in the broader role or broader like grand scheme of things in the organization. Talk to the people, learn their lingo and everything. So that's when like you can understand that the value that you are creating and when it accumulates with the other the value from the other people. That's how you create the real value for the business. So be that sometimes yourself from the design that or your all your design thinking and approaches and frameworks and everything. And that's how like maybe it can help you uh, like generate the real value. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think, and I've learned this, especially in this part of the world, but it's for everywhere. I think we love the process way too much. That's the other challenge designers have. And we think the process is valid, but it's not. The business doesn't care about the process. They care about the impact. And I think too often we sometimes forget about the impact because we're obsessed with the process. Um, someone, yeah, who's there wanting to share? Yeah, hi. So I was actually the person talking to Pete about the factory thing. <laughs> so I just wanted to share a bit more about the context of what the factory system is. So it, it, it is indeed true that what they've done, a certain company, certain business have done their factory settings for more than a decade, for more than, for five years, ten years, and whatnot. And I, and I as, a, as a designer, I come in, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't do much if I we're just to come in, make new process, change everything that's already worked. So basically what what I can learn from it is that rather than just changing what is already working, I can merely find some gaps and then enhance it. So basically is a that's the that's the value that at least that I'm trying to do. So that way rather than rather than changing everything create from scratch, try try different things that we don't even know if, if it's working or not. Let's just Understand what's what's working. Find if there's anything working or not. If there's anything that is not working, then answer. That's how that's how I see it. And that's been honestly, it's been a challenge. Uh, it's been a thing. It's been an ongoing conversation for almost a year. And I personally just barely scratching the surface. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much a few steps for me. Leopold, crash was it? So crash. There were three questions. So before I forget. They're just stacking them up. Sure. Uh, that gentleman in the back, I think that is an excellent point, and that's probably more or less the answer, to be honest. Um, I think as designers and as creators, you get so caught up in the aesthetic and the beauty and the craftsmanship and the artistic nature of it, and you absolutely should. I don't want to dissuade you from that, 
But a design at the end of the day is really two things, right? It's to engage, grab people's attention, keep them interested, and then to deliver the information. Where, when, what time, why should I care, right? And the second part is arguably more important because that's what separates design from art. So if you go to like, I always go to like, when I went from being, to your point, to being an art director to a business owner, I came from a very presentation heavy background. We would spend weeks on presentations because the projects were worth $10, $20 million, right? And we would have custom art, and we had like emotion coming in, and it was brilliant, and we loved it. Then I went to being a business owner, and all of a sudden I had three areas to care about. One was the design and presentation, the second one was the customer interaction with what's the customer actually trying to achieve, working with the one-on-one, -on -one. and the third one is the business outcome. We need them to actually convert. And now that I work across all three, I've completely changed the way that I design now. For example, there's somebody in this room which is actually a customer of mine on the operation side, not even the creative side. And we ran this experiment while he was coming through the system, where I sent out three different proposals, three different clients, Word, PowerPoint, we used to use Keynote, we've done uh, uh, Notion, we've done Pitch.com, we tried them all, right? In the first 18 months of running our business, you kind of have to try all this shit by fire. You don't get to say no to the manager, and you don't get to go home, right? You always at work. And basically, the one that we sent to the client worked perfectly. Then we took that one, and we gave it to the next three clients, and they all converted. So now all I have is a single page on text on Notion. When I used to spend half a day creating these massive presentations and we sent to clients and they scroll the bottom and see the price the same. So now, if somebody was, so how do you make an argument, right? You understand this is the customer needs. So now someone comes to me and says, how do I do a great pitch design? And say, here's a one page notion. They go, oh, can, you, can you use more fonts? Can you make it pop? I can confidently say, you know, fuck your pop. You don't need pop. And the reason why I can confidently say that is I could then say, listen, when clients come in and they see this presentation, they interact with it in this way. They get, for instance, first question was a great question. We really struggled with this. was how much information do you actually give customers, right? Too much, and they, they run away. Not enough, and they ask too many questions. If I was to then give you that pitch, and I could say, fuck the poll, why I can say that to you is because I can guarantee this is the highest tested turnover conversion rate with the customers getting exactly what they want. And if you're internal at a company, if you understand the end-to-end -end of where this is going to go, and you include that in your design, you can very confidently make that argument, argument uh, point when you're showing your designs. I think that was one of your initial questions as well, was like, how do I actually convince them that this is the correct design? You convince them by knowing that it is the correct design, and you know it by going and figuring it out. And then you're able to tell them confidently this is what you want, but this has the highest customer conversion rate, and highest customer conversion rate gives you the most amount of revenue. You're solving all three buckets. You're solving the design bucket, the customer bucket, and the business need at the end. Uh, <coughs> I love everything that you said, and I agree. I know, this is where we're going to work so well together. Yeah. I'm like, practical, practical. Yes. No, no, no. I, I, I agree I'm with totally it, opposite, but, but, but here's what I learned, that yeah. this is a <laughs> rational <laughs> process. And I, you know, for those of you who know me, I, I preach rationality, I love rationality. Yeah, but the, the mind doesn't work this way, right? I think sometimes, or most of the times, you have to trigger another part of the brain. Uh, for those of you who know the work of Daniel Kahneman, System 1, System 2, anyone know that? Okay. Yeah. So basically you have to trigger the, huh? Grateful. Yeah, you have to trigger the part of the brain that needs shortcut, okay? And rationality takes work. So I give an example on how to solve. Sometimes you don't have to rechange the project or rebuild your whole presentation. Sometimes it's what you do before the presentation that will change everything. And I'm gonna give you an example, a case study. <clears throat> From a restaurant, waiter. One of the studies they did uh, is they asked the waiter, or to give a minute to the client, okay, and to say, you know, thank you with the bill, okay? So by simply giving the minute, he got 3% increase in his tips. And you know, the waiter relies a lot on his tips, right? Now, and this is a principle of reciprocity, which is you should always give first before you ask the client. Now, here's what they did next. 
they gave the client two minutes with the bill. Guess how much it increased, the tip increased? From 3% to 12%. Wow. That's amazing. Two minutes, it costs nothing. It doesn't cost changing the presentation. But here's what's so fascinating. In a third study, the waiter came in and gave one minute. Okay, and then he went back and he said, Oh, because you're a great folk, I'm a great guy here, I'm gonna give you a second one. Just by doing this, just for you, because you're a great guy, he gave him a second minute, it increased to 19%. 19%. Now, is this rational? Absolutely not. You know, can you explain it rationally? No, but it's how the mind works, and that's why sometimes you meet someone and they give first, they give you something, a kind of value, immediately you're building a relationship with them, and you say, oh, that's a very generous person, I wanna work with a person like you. So the key takeaway, I think, on that point is, sometimes you don't have to rework everything, sometimes you, all you need to do is to ask, what can I give first, before start asking for something else. I just want to touch on that because I think, I mean, just bringing it to, to my world and to some of our world, this is often a challenge that I've had. Even, you know, like in Australia, for example, as designers, we, I joined a company with nine designers. Three years later, there were 42 designers, a very large software accounting company. And exactly to your point, Leopold, we kept thinking, why can't people understand us instead of what some people had said to me and, and, and the leadership we got to is, instead of trying to convert product managers, the business, stakeholders, developers, why don't we ask them what they need from us first before we try to convert them? Why don't we speak to the engineer or the developer or the product manager and understand them better instead of getting frustrated and assuming, even if they are wrong, by the way, yes. just on that point, that is the secret of influence and persuasion that most people miss. Yeah. Influence is not about what do I want from you? How can I influence you? Influence is about what do you want? Right? And then my role is to bridge the gap. Brenton wants to say something. Yeah. I've got a question because I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, but being Dubai, the place that we are, there's so many different cultures, so many different ways of thinking about things. Coming from different cultures, we've got a different way of problem solving, a way of receiving information and communicating. How do you kind of take this approach, maybe into a business here, which will have so many different cultures and so many different ways of communicating? How do you kind of adapt to that? This is a great question because, again, the principle of persuasion are universal. They work on everybody. But culture differ, right? So you have to understand the different culture. But because they're universal, it means, so for example, the principle of reciprocity is more likely to work on everyone. It just depends how you do it. So for example, for some culture, if you give them something, let's say, material, materialistic, they're going to take it as a bribe. So you have to be very careful on how you approach it. But I don't think you can escape that. And simply because that's, I will never be persuaded to buy anything from you or to invest in you if I don't have a relationship with you, right? And that's why when we go online, for example, to buy something, we have to build a relationship with that brand. Oh, I see that brand more often, I'm connected with it, I like it. You're building a relationship, right? So I don't think there's an escape from that. Uh, we just have to learn how to, how to understand the different cultures and act that Yes, we're saying the same thing, but I'm yelling at everybody, and you're telling a story, basically. If you can find out what the person wants and speak that, speak that language to them, your success rate is going to go through the roof no matter what you're doing. One thing that's interesting about this is that we all know this from sales. We all know sales scripts. And the reason why sales scripts work is because you're in a contained environment, you're doing the same thing over and over again, and you're trying to get a single goal, right? We know sales scripts, we've seen this in movies, Wolf of Wall Street, sales scripts, right? So that's not just a sales thing. 
The reason why you're able to measure it is because it's contained and singular, and you're trying to get a certain outcome. You can do this in any avenue of any of your life. If you go into, you see this in the pickup culture game, right? Because it's the same thing, it's a contained environment, you're doing a set amount of moves, and you're trying to get a single goal. So if you're looking to improve your communication skills to be a better persuader, you can do this in every aspect of your life, because this is every aspect of life. You do thousands of these contained single environments across a single day. So if you meet somebody, you could change the way you firmly shake their hand. You could look them in the eye, you could look down. You're gonna have a very different reaction from that individual. And the reason why we notice it in sales is because we do it, we do it repeatedly, very quickly, back to back to back to back. So then you can see the difference that just a few different words can make. The point I really wanna take, you're gonna take away one thing from tonight, from me at least, take away this. It's not just sales, it's like that. That's all of your interactions across all of your life. It's interaction with your partner, interactions with your kids, interactions with people you work with. You notice it in sales, it's contained and it's repeated. But if you're looking to be more communicative, you're trying to um, be better understood, as this gentleman on his phone here, the visa guy, that was his exact point. <laughs> You can, if you really want to start applying this into your life, I'd love you to take something away from tonight and be able to use it. Run this experiment in your own life. You can do it all day. No one's even going to notice. And it's something that I've been doing because I used to be a terrible communicator. I used to try and help people, and then at the end of the day, everybody was pissed off. And I couldn't figure it out why. Initially, I thought everyone was too soft, and, you know, that's just the world the way it is. And then after a few years, I realized that I was the problem. All right? So I implore you to... Do the salesman script on everything. If you're going to meet your manager in that contained factory environment and you're trying to get a different outcome, run it as an experiment. Try five different ways. And then whichever one is the most positive, take that and then do five variations of that. You will be extremely surprised how different outcomes are with your... How different your outcomes are. Um, and you can use it to greatly improve your private and professional life. No, I love that. And, and I just didn't want to miss an opportunity um, to answer your question earlier, Brenton. Because I wish I read this book 10 years ago. And the, on strategies, the culture map yes, that's the one. is an amazing book. So amazing. Yeah. We've got an amazing speaker doing a talk about it in January. But I agree with, with what Leopold answered, but also... I think often, same thing we all accuse me of. We, we are too quick to give the value away and, or to get frustrated in the factory. And we need to apply design to our own lives. We need to think of the strategy. So the culture map, for those of you who haven't read it, it's not like a spoiler who did it, but it gives you strategies and it gives you the science behind the differences in our culture. And yes, it gets complicated when we live in Dubai and we come from many places, but more often than not, we can and we should have a different strategy to that person or manager based on the culture that they have, even if it's a, a mixed culture. So strategies, just like communication, are an important thing that we, we need to adapt. Leopold wants to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I, I want to give you something practical, which most probably you, do, you, you know and you apply, but I'm just going to put it in a certain frame so you can apply it every day. So one of the most powerful principles of persuasion is the principle of liking. We want to work with people whom we like, right? People will make business with you if they like you. Now, this sounds simple, and sometimes deceptively simple, but guess what, specifically as designers, it's so hard for us to make people like us, and even harder, for us to find something to like in them, <laughs> right? And that's why, I mean, I've been in advertising for many years, so I know how it goes, and we're always speaking on our clients and all that. But here's the thing, here's what I've learned, and I wish I learned that long time ago. You want to be successful for anything, you go and find something to like in the person you want to persuade. And I highly recommend you do it now. So here's how you do it. Okay, I'm going to give you the superficial level and then the uh, much more powerful. The superficial level is you look at Natalie and you say, I love that vest. 
As long as it's genuine, it's true, you're not faking it, that's how you start a conversation. I was talking with someone, he was talking about his watch. He has some, what is it, yes sir, uh, what is he? He has some kind of magnetic watch. And I asked him, like, well, why, why would you buy that? He's like, it's not even practical, and he's a designer. Why do you buy it? like, well, it's a conversation starter. You see, that's amazing. So that's why, it can be on something superficial, okay? However, if you're going to meet, and I'm telling you, you know these ideas, it's all about how you strategize to make, to internalize them. If I'm going to meet a client today, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna research, research them. I'm gonna check, for example, I had a meeting with someone a couple of days ago. He read a great article. I read the article he wrote, I dissected it. The first thing I said when I entered the meeting is, I read your article. And this one and two and three points are so powerful, I want to talk about them. Now that's so simple, it's doable. And that's what I love about persuasion. It's not rocket science, right? It's, I call them tiny, tremendous. It's tiny things you do that will create tremendous influence in your life, okay? Uh, so, cultural differences, for sure. But how would you know if you don't talk to other person and try to infer something to life in them? Make sense? Try it today. You know, what, what? Definitely check that book out. It's an amazing book. It'll totally blow your mind. Culture map. It's, it's an incredible book. It just it gives you a very simple breakdown of the way that different cultures communicate. It gives you, if you're a graph man, there's graphs in there. And it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent book. It will definitely make you a better communicator, or at least make you better at understanding. Um, I met someone in, when I was in Italy, and he was an American guy that came over from, um, from the US, and he was in sales for many years. And there's one thing that I learned about influence that was so simple. And um, he said, what's your name? I said, my name's Natalie. And I realized that he was, when we were talking for like half an hour, he repeated my name maybe about five or 10 times. And then he explained to me, and then I said, I really like this guy. He's such a nice guy. And he told me, um, and then I realized, how many people have you met in life where they always forget your name, right? It's, it feels like you're invisible. And it's something so simple. How can you forget someone's name? But if you make the effort to remember that person's name and the best advice is just repeat it. I know Ray, Ray's name. Where is Ray's name? Pete. I, I'm, I'm trying to like, and I try and remember as many names as I can in the room. I was a a juror in, in the UK, you know, when you had to go on trial and, and there were 12 jurors and I wanted to be the head juror. I really did. I was like, I want to be the one that, you know. And I thought, how am I going to do this? Because they had to nominate you. And I said, I'm going to do this by remembering everyone's name in half an hour. And I literally went, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, and I was like, so Emma, so, um, and, and by the end, one, I just knew everyone's name in half an hour. And, uh, when we had to vote who'd be head juror, guess who got head juror? I did it. And I, I swear it's because I just made the effort to learn someone's name. And I just think that's the first easy step to liking. Yeah, and if I can just add how this is applied in design, just look at the email. How we do email for a day, right? Like the first thing is you get a customized message. Hello, Nathan. And some people even repeat the name, right? <clears throat> now we're accustomed to it nowadays, we don't think about it much, but that is actually triggering our mind with, oh, I know that person. And that's why if you're receiving emails from people you didn't subscribe to their channel, you know, you will unsubscribe at the end of the day. So that's important and it's applied in everything, in digital and emails and design. So absolutely, the name is the sweetest sound you will ever hear. I just want to switch it up a little bit. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, before we do that. Um, I'm just going to summarize for you, because I'm an action steps man. Reciprocity is massive. That is a very, very good skill. It's used in uh, democratic elections. If you ask somebody who they're going to vote for, if they give you an answer then, it's 50% more likely they're going to vote for that person on the day of the thing, because they've already committed and they want to change their life. Reciprocity um, is massive. 
saying somebody's name is related to that, that's you putting in the effort, which is why reading the article and bringing it up, you're, and being liked is also huge. But those two things are related. You can also do, if you're looking for tips and tricks, you can do reflect and confirm. Reflect and confirm is when you take something that, something that someone said to you, and you take the end of it, and you say it back to them to keep the conversation going. The other thing is confirm is when you figure out what somebody, how they want to be perceived, and you tell them that's how you perceive them. If somebody wants to be perceived as spontaneous, you go, oh man, you are so spontaneous, they will really like you for that. But it's all kind of related to the fact that you're actually paying attention and going into it. And so those are very, very key things. If you start with their own experiments, you're going to be much better than One other thing is a great way, because there's no particular courses um, of this specifically, but if you really want to learn about this on a deeper level, the best way to learn about it is how it's used against you. Essentially, the best way to look at that is social media and geopolitics. If you can look into those two areas, the great hack, remember that documentary came out? I remember watching that and thinking it was just marketing 101, the whole world exploded over that, because that was social media being used against you. And all that is, is really fundamental persuasion techniques. So I'll really look into that if you want. And then also, you become a much more street smarter person. Because now, when a salesman calls me up and he says my name over and over again, I know what he's doing. And you're less likely to be persuaded. If you're less likely to be persuaded, you can make more honest decisions for yourself. I, I have to strongly disagree. Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Finally, we got there. No, uh, I mean Okay, because this is a common question I often ask uh, when I'm doing training in uh, ethical persuasion. People tell me, okay, what, what happens if all of us know these principles, right? So you know that you're using them against me. And my answer is, I'm not using them against you. I'm using them for you. And so the, if we all here learn the principles of persuasion, we're going to actually create better relationship because you know I'm using them for your benefit. And we can talk, we didn't talk about why it's ethical, we can talk about that if you want. So that's one. Two, raise your hand if you're excited for Black Friday. Come on, be honest, be honest. Be honest, yeah. Oh, oh, no one is excited for Black Friday. Okay. So, okay. It's like a big sales Oh, come on. See, see, see. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Anyway, so. Okay, so I, I, use, I used to say the same, you know, I'm not excited about Black Friday, I don't care about shopping, it's not true. Every time there's Black Friday, I'm excited to buy, okay? So the idea is you cannot protect yourself sometimes against the unethical ways of uh, using persuasion, you unless... You know what they are, though. Exactly, unless you understand how they work, yeah. right? And that's why you need to understand what makes it ethical, and oh, okay, so this person is using it against me or for me. Uh, so I don't think you just can infer it from just looking online how, how people are doing it. Because, because you don't have time to think. That's the whole idea of, of persuasion, is that it's a shortcut. You don't have time to, to sit and evaluate, oh, is he using it? It's just a meeting. It's unconscious. Yeah, so I thought we might get to this point. Because you had written a book on ethical persuasion. Yeah. And if I wrote a book on persuasion, I'd probably call creative uses of persuasion. Um, he is right, though, in the sense that you don't use it against people. It's kind of like everybody who learns a martial art says you're, you're much less likely to get into a physical confrontation with somebody if you know how to fight. It's kind of the same thing. If you're aware of how communication and persuasion is influential on you, you're much less likely to get unethically used against you. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay let, let me ask you a question. So you said you're a reputation builder, is that right? Yes. And you care about building the reputation of your clients? Yes. And when you meet someone who doesn't have a reputation, do you have a certain step to help them build their reputation? Yeah, so we're still friends, so I'm not arguing. No, no, no. <laughs> but, 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 let me say, everybody has a reputation, whether you like it or not. You're walking around with one. 
If somebody says, oh, that's so classic here, that's something that he always does, that is your reputation. Okay, so my question is, if I came to you and said, I need to build my reputation, sure. would you help me? Yes. Okay, and if your proposal was too expensive, would you make a concession for you? Possibly. What, what would make you say yes or no? Uh, it would depend on the client, the goals, the outcomes. Okay, so if I'm a good client, I really want to build my reputation, I'm a good person, but I just find your price to be so high, and I'm asking if you can find a concession. Would you do it for me? Maybe, it really depends. Okay, so the moment that you do it for me, okay, you are actually using the principle of persuasion to help me take the step to say yes to you, mm -hmm. to make a better decision. And that's the difference between manipulation and persuasion. You persuade people because they, it's beneficial for them to take your offer. And that's why your offer must be good, must be true, and must be beneficial for both parties. You see? Where it becomes manipulated is when you don't have a good product, when you are actually trying to not, it's a win-loss situation. Think about it this way. Every time the trade, the persuasion includes win-loss, then it's unethical. I agree. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, hold on, he, he, he said don't use it against people for evil ways. And I, I agree with that. No, I just used it wrong because... Uh, <laughs> I just use it on me. So that's how I persuaded my mom to stop smoking. By the way. Yeah, it's in the book you can read about. And really, so I, do I want to harm my mom? Absolutely not. She is smoking. I want to help her stop smoking. How did I help her? Well, you need to read the book. But the idea is I helped her see okay, something beyond smoking. And that's why I said designers are designers of decisions. You see, we design decisions to help people make better choices. That was quite fun. I don't know if you also noticed, but before I disagreed, I said, we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> to keep it, you want to keep it friendly. Um, so, <laughs> that was awesome. Finally, they disagreed. Do we have any questions? I want to change the, the tempo a little bit. Anyone's got any burning questions? Yes, we didn't hear nothing yet. You know? Be very quiet. They really hate. Why is that? Um, so something I did recently was, uh, well, what I've realized in the last few years, maybe through just getting older or whatever, around business or whatever, is what you guys are talking about is totally correct. And like, regard, you could frame it as persuasion, but I kind of also think of it now as and the layers of communication, right? So when you're, for example, when you send a WhatsApp message, you might send about three, four minute WhatsApp messages to crash, right? Do I mean to send you a four minute WhatsApp message, or can I send him a 30 second WhatsApp message, right? So it's the layers of information, uh, uh, the way that you persuade people and how fast they can absorb that information and get what they want, it's really important. And what's really interesting is when you think about that at like a, a country level and how easy it is to confuse people by just pouring them with more and more shit all the time, which is you know stuff that we've seen in recent elections just the last few days, it's a really interesting subject. So design being you know a big part of design is about being simple, right? That's the point. And, and that's very difficult to do. I've changed how I describe my business and what I do like about ten times on my homepage. And also thinking about what you're saying, what do you tell people what you do? Like, I don't say I'm a graphic designer, I say I help companies transform and, and be as successful as possible. You know? So, um, but yeah, I think the, the way that we deliver information is really interesting. And we all need to practice it a lot because it takes practice. And you've all been kind of, you talk about being like actors or confident or persuading. You also need to think about how do you be like an actor almost. So I did like some improv training in 3D and 3D fun. It was really embarrassing, but it was really beneficial. But it's all about training your your mouth to 
to be able to um, get the right response than to, to pass the ball to somebody to get a positive response so you can bounce around and, 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 you know, and progress. Whereas if uh, you know, your, your head's down or whatever, it's, um, it doesn't work. So but we've got to practice that. So like we all go to the gym and we do that with our muscles, but we don't practice our mind, our what we say very often, or at least I didn't. But actors are training that all the time. So I guess that's what I like to swim as well. Anyway. Uh, Jonathan, I, I love that, yeah. I'll, I'll sorry. On that. But I just want a yeah. quick one. I mean it goes back to what we were talking about with strategies and Brenton's point on the culture map. And also your point on having a communication strategy, a culture strategy, and acting, right? That's, we need to work on these strategies. It doesn't just happen. Um, Leopold, and then we've got it goes, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's an important point that Gareth made because it's about the messenger, you as a communicator. It's about the message, and it's about the arrangement of the message. So that's, so the arrangement of the information is sometimes more important than the information itself. So quick example, a group of Boy Scouts were trying to raise donation for their, you know, uh, scout. And they, they went out there and said, hey, we're selling popcorn, would you like to buy one? And most people said no. You know, 15% of people said yes, only to the popcorn. They changed the information of the message, they said, do you support the Boy Scout? 100% of people said yes. You know, this is a great call, you support it. And then they said, because you support it, would you be willing to buy popcorn to support us? It's the same message, only the script is positioned in a different way. You see? So you confirm exactly what they said they Yeah, you made them commit to something like that. Yes, right? And then, okay, if you committed to that, then. My mom, yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to share a method that I use usually with clients. So I always set a goal of why I'm going there and what I want to achieve out the whole The second one is storytelling. I always try to anticipate what their their mind patterns or how their platform works. So what questions might I have in order to structure the narrative that I have? Then there's always a framework that is Whenever you work with business people, they're very structured and things need to be diluted. So if I offer a framework for ages each and every time you get a project, then they're able to kind of follow through to understand why they're going on ages. And then there's always going to be some ethics where anything I'm saying is backed up by research. And this way I no longer need to persuade, but it's more of educate. And on their own, they reach the same conclusion I have, and then I can add that. Yes, right. So I had a very interesting experience um, four and a half years ago. I joined the agency and I had to work with a product manager and my strategy developers, which I'd never done before. And I didn't quite understand. We were playing in the world of social AR. And it took me a while to figure it out, but I understood that developers think very black and white. It's either yes or no. And my product manager and I became work and work wife and work husband, and I started to understand how his brain worked. And what I was able to help him understand was that even if the client is asking for X, the way that you're looking at X, they don't really care how X is built, right? So they're just looking for the solution. They know where they want to go. They actually don't know what they want. And that's a big thing I'm sure most of you guys have experienced in this region. You'll go through hundreds of rounds of iterations and changes of the brief and my team would get super frustrated. And what I was able to help them understand and help myself understand was we need to understand where they want to go and if we can come to them with a solution and help them actually understand what they need to get to where they need to go and become that person that can help guide them, that was when we actually started working really well with the clients. And I actually just listened to a very interesting book called um, How to Build a Story Brand by Donald Miller. I don't know if anyone's listened to it, it's right. really, really good. Um, and it's really fun because he compares books, brands and building stories to movies. So it's really relatable. And at the end of the day, you don't want to be the hero. You need to make sure that your client 
is the hero, right? The customer is always the hero. You're the guy. So think about Star Wars, right? You want to be Yoda. The client is Luke Skywalker. So if you can look at it that way, and you're helping to guide and get them to understand, you say, right, we're going to get you there. And if you can get them within timeline and budget, then you won. But you're going to have to help them get there. And if you can become that person, they'll come back to you 100 times over. I love that, by the way. I always say great leaders are guides who, were, who once were heroes. You start as being the hero, then you become the guy. Thank you. Right, so uh, everyone, so I'm Chad, very good to the Bible. This has been amazing as a design community heritage. Amazing. So uh, I'm, I'm a product leader, and I'm absolutely not a designer, but I've had the pleasure of meeting with designers. And there's, um, there's a couple of harsh realities that you know, I, I want to share just from a product perspective. Um, one there is like this design conversation very very rarely reaches the CEO or the executive level in the corporate, um, and that's a real harsh reality because there's so much great designers and great community, but at the exec level in most cases, you know, a lot of CEOs think design is just cost, right? and that's a real harsh reality. And the reason I share that is very often I've gone to a CEO to say, hey, we're any more designers, and the first thing they say is, wow. Like me, they, don't, they don't understand it. That's a real harsh reality that you know, at the exact level, we need more design leaders to break through at the C level or the, the VP level, things like The other harsh reality is usually there are very limited advocates at the exact level for design. Um, some understand design looks great, they speak about the pixels and say it's so amazing, but they don't go up to the, the leaders and say, hey, that designer did a phenomenal job improving our checkout experience, right? And that's so important because I see so many fabulous designers trying to persuade their plus one, which is a design leader, leader or design manager, but they have no true influence at the exact level. So I really encourage you guys, for anyone that works in corporate, send a letter to your CEO if you can, or you know, find an advocate at the executive level and clearly explain to them how you transform their lives or you know, their business, or how you make revenue for the CPO. Or Use whatever. a case study. So important. That example. So, so so important. What you're trying to do, or what you want to do, give them an example of the problem you solved and how you solved it, and that's the process you want. I, I back that story so well. One of the best things the designer did for me was say, "Hey, look, I just spent you know, 24 hours focusing purely on the checkout experience, and instead of adding features, I just added more white space and moved up, you know, the call to action button, and this is the impact on the revenue line. And that guy got so much of my time." After that, and it's, it's the simple things, but you just need to be able to persuade the right person. And I think the last thing I'll, I'll share is there is also a common misconception that you know these big decisions are made in meeting rooms or in exec sessions. There are so many decisions around how many designers you add to an organization, or whether somebody gets promoted, or whether or not you want to invest in design. That happens offline, right? It happens over a beer, or it happens at the golf course. Um, and you know, I challenge you guys to try and spend more time not having the purest conversation about why design is so important or design thinking. I think it's much better to ask you know, people about their kids and you know, spend time talking about, I think you said it too, right? Asking about, hey, you know, what school do you go to? Hey, by the way, you know, I teach design, I'm happy to teach your kids. And before you know it, that same person will say, hey, actually, you know, I want to spend more time with you. So those are just a few harsh realities from a part perspective that I just wanted to, to share. Okay, just a quick tip here that you can use. So never go to the CEO and tell your CEO, I want to hire a designer. The CEO doesn't want to hire a designer, right? The CEO wants to make more money. The CEO wants to solve the problem, right? And so that's again the principle of commitment and consistency. You need to gather, you need to harness small yeses from the CEO before you introduce the designer. Do you want to uh, have a certain growth. You want people to press on this checkout more. You want to, so you have to harness more yeses, and then you say, oh, by the way, the person who will solve this problem is a designer specialized in one, two, three, four. Right? Now the framing, you're anchoring the whole uh, proposition on solving a certain problem, not on hiring a designer. That's one. Two, and this is a message for everyone, uh, designers 
Unfortunately, we have a bad reputation. I say we, but sometimes I think of myself as a designer. We have a we have a reputation of being of being uh, introvert or you know we will backstage, right? You wanna hear more yes? You build your authority. You're not a designer. Oh, you're a designer, but actually every week you're speaking in this meetup. Oh, you're active on social media and helping, uh, helping other people. You need to position yourself in the eyes of your management as a person of authority, and that's when they'll be more likely to say yes to you. So, I hope this helps. Cool. Uh, I, I don't know if this is going to come out as a question, it might just be a series of thoughts. But um, firstly, I, I love the, the conversation and presentation, it's been, been really informative. Um, and when we think about persuasion, it's interesting because um, persuasion sometimes can be con kind of uh, construed as like these binary things, right? Like where one side's trying to persuade the other, one, try one side's trying to persuade, you know, kind of put forward their point of view. And I think as an ex designer who's no longer got design in the title, um, I empathize and see that you know, designers naturally are quite empathetic, curious individuals with, you know, in many senses, quite emotional, and sometimes that may really manifest in very high conviction kind of like thoughts, right? Like, we believe this is the right thing to do, and if you don't believe that, then you're dumb, and you're wrong, and, and etc. Um, and I think it's really interesting because, like, there's this sort of interplay between how forceful we're trying to get our point across and, like, how we're not listening to what the other maybe person's trying to say. And I think, like, it's kind of laying down a story around. Like, why are we so certain about certain things? And also, like, how are we talking probabilities rather than certainties, right? So, if, for example, I'm a, a business person, and I say, well, how probable is that insight really to the success of this product, for example? And I just come up with the numbers around, what's the probability that that particular insight is relevant to this kind of outcome? <coughs> Vice versa, if I was a designer having a conversation with someone in business, like, I would kind of say, well, how probable are we and confidence in that decision without the, you know, let's say, um, data points that we could get from research. And I think, like, there's this art kind of, I really like the Yoda kind of, um, the Yoda sort of um, uh, metaphor, because I think Yoda in, in Star Wars is actually quite a mysti mystical, cryptic person. Like, you know, he speaks in, you know, Yoda English, it's not real English. And so kind of like there's a level of interpretation that I think that, like, we need to, as designers or, you know, People who care a lot about the experience of what we're designing, actually kind of play it back to kind of business people and say, like, well, what's the risk of doing this if we don't do this? And like, what's the uh, probability that we get this wrong? And are we comfortable with that? So I think that's kind of like going back to the whole jargon and sort of um, talking in, in business language. There's a way to kind of, I would say, um, play that back to kind of business people in a way that's quite. I would say artist, not artistic, but like you want to kind of have a, a way to kind of create uh, a level of like understanding and poetry to it. Right? Like, be quite uh, and so that's just, just my thoughts on that. Uh, and I'm really glad you brought the question out because it's one of my favorite books by Aaron Meyer, which is great. Um, the, Ge the Geography of Thought is also a really nice book that has a similar idea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, have one final takeaway, and then you can speak to these guys all night. I just want to kind of bring it home. I know people love the network. If they were to remember one final thought. I'll be short, I think. Um, I think tonight was good, and we probably, we spoke a lot. If you remember the highlights of reciprocity and some of the names and new explosion, I think you'll get a lot from that. I'll say two very quick closing things, which are not related to anything we'll talk about. One, there, there isn't really harsh reality, it's just reality. It either is or it isn't. Um, so I think the sooner you accept that, the easier your life will be. And two, designers, we tend to circle in on ourselves and create a little dome, and then we talk about how everybody else is stupid. If you're doing something that's not working, I would strongly encourage you to entertain the possibility that you're wrong. Uh, I have a small gift for all of you. Uh, Everyone gets a car. <laughs> Check under your seats. <laughs> so so uh, I built this uh, seven days crash course. Uh, you just 
I'm going to show you a QR code. You can the see the crash it. course. Yeah, and there's no there's no email, so I'm not taking your emails or anything. It's just you know for you. And so I want to share that. Uh, but also there is one idea I want to I want you to take home, which I mentioned in my book. Uh, it's one line, and I really want want you to remember it. And I talked about it for those who attended my TEDx talk. What you design designs you. And I want you to think deeply about that. Every choice you make when it comes to design, it designs you back, right? It builds your character, it builds your value, it builds what's, what's important to you. Which means, when you're making a decision, it's not just I'm doing something for my client, it's actually designing my character, it's designing the way I live my life, it's doing, and that's why design is so powerful. So that's my final word. Let me share with you the QR code. Please. Awesome. Thank you to our amazing speakers. Thank you for coming. We got like three more hours here, so uh, don't ask. Uh, one final thing. Next week, we've got a really, really special meetup. I know I say that every time, but we've got a guy coming from London. Um, very, very lucky to have him. Leopold's got the QR code if anyone wants uh, this, this free gift. Natalie and I used to work at a fully remote company called Omnipresent, and one of the best, if not the best, product managers, VPs of product that I worked with, there were five heads of product there, and this guy was definitely my favorite. He's a great human. Um, he's coming to Abu Dhabi, and he's going to be running an all-day workshop with uh, Chris in the back and myself. And then in the evening, we're, we're not just going to make the most out of it, we have a workshop, a workshop, a meetup at a new venue in Abu Dhabi in Aldar Square, so Aldar's headquarters, very cool. And it's in next to Yas Mall, so it's only 45 minutes from the marina, it's probably quicker than it took you to get here, because uh, going to Abu Dhabi these days is quicker. Um, so that's next Wednesday, and if you like the venue, which I think you did, uh, ch chat to Peter, chat to Jack or myself, or and Leopold, Nada, and Natalie, we're, we're looking at a early Christmas kind of end of year party, so uh, look out for that. And thank you for coming. Leopold, you want to say one last thing? Uh, just if you're interested uh, to get a copy of my book, come to me. Uh, it's uh, written by me and seven other uh, coaches, uh, certified uh, trainers and ethical persuasion. So it has case studies. How much? How much? How much? About 100 dirhams. Um, yeah, so if you, if you want, you get a signed copy of it. Take risks, have fun, and back yourself. Love it. Something as harsh as I do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.